What is going on? Welcome into Bayou Bengals football. So that's one guy I think that is going to be key for LSU to have success this year, not only passing the ball, but running the ball is Miles Frazier. Miles Frazier, you know, you could argue Miles Frazier is the most underrated player on the LSU team. And what I love about Miles Frazier, this guy just really competes. Uh, he's a former transfer. Uh, Miles Frazier just played a lot of high-end level football. This will be his third year as a starting starting guard for LSU. Miles Frazier is just an excellent, excellent football player. I think that he'll be he is going to be a key part to LSU having a lot of success this year. Like Miles Frazier is just one of those glue guys that you really need on this football team. Kind of like if Jacoby and Gilroy emerges on the defensive line. That type, that impact he would have would be the, is similar to the impact Miles Frazier would have on the offensive line. Miles Frazier, when you watch his game, you, you aren't really wowed away from an athletic standpoint with with Frazier, but you are you do really just you do really just get an appreciation for his skill set. It's a guy that's really always looking to pick up, always looking to help, can recognize stunts. He plays fast, even though he's not the best, most easy mover. But, yeah, um, Frazier, just an excellent, excellent guard, and he is going to be a strong piece to this offensive line. And he is just such a perfect complement to Will Campbell, Emery Jones, um, Dellinger, Turner, and maybe even Zeeland's hurt if we see him out there just because you know he's going to do his job even though he's not going to be – he's not going to just – he's not going to maul people. He's not going to be that guy that you can count on to to really be like. Um, he's not going to guy that you can really count on to just absolutely uh, to take on opponents' best players and lock him down. But uh, when he goes against the guy, he's he's going to win the, against the guy he's matched up a, a very high percentage of the time. So Miles Frazier, one of my favorite players on this LSU team, certainly one of their unsung guys. Excellent, excellent offensive lineman, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to watching him play. I think that, you know, at the end of this season, he'll be another guy like, you know, Jacoby and Gilroy, D-Tackle, You hopefully he emerges and plays well. Ovio Gofu, Miles Frazier, these are all going to be guys that at the end of the season, LSU just does something special. You'll really look at these guys, and I always love finding guys like, like Miles Frazier, some of these unsung guys. I think over the years I've really grown to appreciate these type of guys on a football team. Like he's a guy that if you're just a casual LSU fan, you probably don't know his name. Like if you casually follow LSU, you probably you probably know Harold Perkins, you probably know uh, you might know Omar Spates, you know Jaden Daniels cuz he's the quarterback, but you probably don't know. You're probably not familiar with Miles Frazier, but yeah, hardcore if you're a hardcore LSU fan, you know all the players, you know a lot of their their different skill sets and what they bring. You you really have an appreciate for appreciation for Miles Frazier's game. Um, so he'll, he'll be a guy certainly that should be, uh, one of the unsung, uh, guys, but I don't know. May, I say that and maybe, you know, maybe Frazier becomes one of those guys where he has such a great year this year. Maybe he goes, you know, second, third round in the draft. And he's a guy that's a starter in the NFL for a long time. Just a nice, solid piece to an NFL team. So Keep an eye on Miles Frazier. Uh, he's number 70 on the offensive line. Started a lot of games and a lot of experience on LSU um, on the offensive line. But, yeah, the other two interior guys, Charles Turner and Garrett Dellinger. Turner and Dellinger, both kind of similar guys, both strong against the run. They both have their strong strong points, but they are they are guys that they their play is not so exceptional that – you have fully trust in them being out there and compl- and playing on a consistent basis. But I think I think that Dellinger, I think that they both are guys that have shown enough that if they are out there, they do have a lot of trust uh, from the coaches. And Dellinger, Turner, at this point, they do have quite a bit of experience too. So to me, I guess if they go with the the normal, they go with the the projected starting five as of right now. Turner at center, Dellinger. Frazier at the guards, Emery Jones, Will Campbell. To me, that just sounds like a really strong. I, I like the way that sounds. I like the way that looks on paper. But to me, I guess it's one of those things where, and to me, I'm not really sure which kind of. I think Brian Kelly's that kind of guy where if he believes that this is already a strong enough unit, he's not going to change it. To me, you know, we talk about Zaylen's herd or one of these guys cracking the top five. I think that the herd. 
would have to be so exceptional in practice to to really beat out one of those guys at this point. Now things can change during the season. Say Dellinger, Turner, Frazier, who knows? Even Campbell, Emery Jones isn't playing well. Maybe you look to to Hurd to try to to try to uh, strengthen the this cohesive unit. But to me, I think that as of right now, that's that's going to be the starting five to start the season. And barring injury or barring just very poor play, I think that's that will is what's going to be needed to get Zeeland's heard or DJ Chester or Marlon Martinez in there. But yeah, the offensive line, I've kind of talked about this before. It's not like a super – they're not super deep on the offensive line, but their starters and their two deep are very strong. So kind of top-heavy, if you will um, – but a strong, a strong unit overall, with consideration uh, of the two deep, and with the consideration of their starters and their two deep. But yeah, Marlon Martinez, another guy they should be really comfortable uh, putting out there. Marlon Martinez, an excellent uh, run blocking guard, uh, a guy that got it, saw some action in the Purdue game, just has not got a lot of reps. But Martinez, I think, is a guy that would be starting at a lot of other places. It kind of reminds me of of Mason Lungsford, the transfer from Maryland. If Lungsford, you know, if Lungsford stayed at Maryland, he probably would have been their starter. Probably would have been, you know, maybe second team, honorable mention, All Big Ten, maybe first team All Big Ten. But yeah, Marlon Martinez, credit him, he stuck it out at LSU. Guy that you think could have transferred and and played right away, but he is staying at LSU. So credit um, LSU. He must be a believer um, in their offensive, uh, in their coaching staff, their offensive line coaches. So Marlon Martinez uh, still at LSU, which is awesome. Mason Lunsford come in. Uh, but back to the point, they're both kind of similar guys that maybe not maybe not um, high-end. Neither of them have ne- necessarily high-end traits, but they are guys that both really do their job well uh, and execute at a high level, uh, play fast, compete, um, do show some aggressiveness, especially Marlon Martinez. So It'll be interesting, um, you know. If uh, you know, we talk about Zealand's herd going in. If those guys are are called into duty, I think both of them are ready, and I bo- I, th- I believe both can deliver high end level play uh, for LSU. But yeah. So let's talk about so let's talk about Jaden Daniels. So we are just dying to see Jaden Daniels unlock or take another step in the passing game. And I think the way I compared it to two ways Jaden Daniels can go. Either he, he becomes more of Terrell Pryor where he just really turns turns to his legs more and more and does not really develop as a passer, or he takes the approach of Jalen Hurts and continues to maybe not maybe not rapidly get better as a passer, but slowly get better as a passer and just become take his passing so seriously that he just makes such, you know, so many little tweaks that it just adds up over time. So I think I hope Jaden Daniels has that de- type of dedication to improve as a passer that he's going to take so many small, subtle changes that it's going to add up and it's going to equate and create big dividends over time. So I hope that is the case for Jaden Daniels. Now, I think that his throwing motion pretty smooth, but I think he's a guy that just needs to, you know, hopefully the game will, will, will slow down even more so this year. Now you got to believe that the game has already slowed down quite a bit for him. He's a guy that does look pretty fairly calm in the pocket, but I think you can always get quicker at at reading a defense. And I think that I don't know what you know. Tom Brady definitely had this. He processed the defense so quick. I'm not sure if that's just to me. I think it comes from obviously experience playing a lot of football, but I think it comes from watching a ton of tape and reading defenses pre-snap and not just reading defenses pre-snap, but reading defenses pre-snap very quickly. So can Jaden Daniels do that? Can he become more of a, can he read defense defenses quicker on the, in the, in the pre-snap? I think that'll be a crucial for Jane Daniels. Um, can he look to, when he looks to his second read, can he get the ball out quicker? Like, can he go to the second read more rapidly? And when he does see, does he not? And then, not hesitating when he sees the downfield throw open. I think that's really key for Jaden Daniels. So some of those things, quicker on the pre-snap, you know, or re- quicker to read defense on the pre-snap, uh, processing things more in the pocket and being less hesitant to throw the ball downfield, especially when you got wide receivers open. So a lot of, uh, you know, 
many ways Jaden Daniels can improve. I think we will see an improved. Um, the main question, the, the main question is just how much is he going to improve? But yeah, uh, I think that's why you have the small percentage of people that want Nussmeyer, just because you really saw in that Georgia game, Nussmeyer is not afraid to take some shots. And now that is the thing: is Jaden Daniels is his lack of wanting to number one take shots downfield and the the lack of ability to consistently hit those is that what's going to cost LSU is that what's going to hold back from LSU to win a national title I think the question is certainly I, I I don't know but or I think the the answer is yeah I don't know at this point but to me you feel like you know every championship team is has a, a quarterback make a big time throw at some point so Jaden Daniels, I'll say this. You know, I kind of I kind of went back and forth, you know, is Jaden Daniels going to hold them back from winning a national title? I'll say this. I believe he does have the ability to step up in the, you know, maybe in the pocket. I've got a picture in my head. Make a big time throw, convert on a key third and long, fourth and long that keeps a drive alive, helps him helps them create a game-winning drive. So, I believe Jaden Daniels is capable of that. We just need to obviously just need to see it. But yeah, one of you guys commented that Jaden Daniels really kept LSU in a couple of games this year. And I actually, yeah, I agree with that. I think that, yeah, he is, you know, Jaden Daniels has earned the right to to get the tag difference maker. Um, I'm going to kind of retract, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really want to give him that label. I haven't really necessarily given that label, but I will say that he is, he can get that label as a difference maker. So now we've kind of counted them before, but you look at LSU and you got, who do we know are for sure difference makers? So you got Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, um, Will Campbell, you know, Emory. I guess we could throw Emory Jones in there, Mason Taylor. So you got five potential true, I would say five true difference makers. What, three or four for sure difference makers on, uh, on offense? And then defense, you at least got two, with her, two for sure with Harold Perkins and uh, Mason Smith. So that's what that is the key to win championships. You know, I've re I've talked about this at nauseum, but true difference makers. And you, you could argue you got five on one side of the ball, three or four on defense. That is really what it takes uh, to get it done. So, and yeah, Brian Kelly talked about you know this year maybe they don't have as many uh, true first round draft picks. Or they don't have uh, five first round draft picks, but if you count the if you're counting the future, then potentially you have you you could have five uh, first round draft picks on this team. Obviously, not all of them are draft eligible this year, uh, but that's that's count accounting that's counting for the future. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, we talked Mason Taylor yesterday. Mason Taylor. Uh, when you watch his highlights, I, I really got a, a true appreciation for this guy's skill set. All the abilities there for Mason Taylor to to be a high end level tight end. I think this year this year will be somewhat telling of how his college career is going to go, and maybe a kind of a glimpse into the NFL future. Because I think that if he takes another step this year in his development, I think what that's saying is that this guy has a chance to be really really good. And is he? You know, is he Brock Bowers? But I think Brock Bowers is just such so far above and beyond all the other tight ends in college, and maybe even <laughs> maybe even some of the elite in the NFL. That I don't think that's a fair comparison. But I think Mason Taylor could he be? You know, could he be in the discussion? You know, a few years from now as one of the top tight ends in the NFL and an exciting uh, prospect. You know, up there at, like with Kyle Pitts, um, some of the uh, who was the who was the top tight end this year. Um, you know, well, I guess could he? I guess he'd be in the discussion, yeah, with um, Laporta or not. Well, not necessarily Laporta didn't go, but could he be in the discussion of Kyle Pitts as far as maybe not like talking about as Kyle Pitts a generational talent, but a guy who you know you know is going to be a really good tight end who is kind of be how to kind of more of the the modern NFL tight end just a really good pass catcher who is a solid who is a capable blocker now he's not necessarily you know Mike Denbrock talked about this and he said he's going to work on it he's not necessarily a great blocker uh, but the point being is a good enough blocker 
that you combine with the receiving traits that he has a chance to be an excellent, uh, excellent NFL football player. So, yeah, I'm excited, excited to see how Mason Taylor uh, performs this year. I think this is a, I think this will be a, a key glimpse into the future for how great uh, potentially this guy could be. Um, but yeah, just kind of. So yeah, I just kind of want to reiterate uh, the purpose uh, of this channel. So I was, I just wanted to uh, get LSU fans the best football talk every single day, and I think we've done. I think we've done maybe not the best as of yet. You know, I believe in my mind it is, but I just want to. I wanted a channel because uh, SEC fans are passionate. So I wanted a channel that would uh, create. You know, would get people something to listen to every day. Other than you know, recruit guys that are going to be incoming recruits a couple years from now. I wanted LSU fans something to listen to each and every day because uh, you know that's what I kind of like. I just like listening to a podcast talking about my teams. You know, I could if I you know I'm a Detroit Lions fan too. I can just listen to them talk about players, and I just you know being a you know doing some scouting too. I enjoy just you know the talk about players and the talk about their strengths and what they do well and. Uh, projecting the type of season they had and talking about the past seasons they had. So I think that's what's really fun about this channel. So I kind of just wanted to reiterate that and talk about the purpose of this channel. But all right, uh, one of my favorite things, I know we talked about this yesterday, is kind of talking about Brian Kelly and his legacy. So to me, you know, is Brian Kelly – is Brian Kelly a guy who's going to feel like a, a big, a lot of pressure uh, this upcoming season? If he, if they say, say LSU, you know, I have eight and five in my head, and I don't, they're not saying they're going to go eight and five, but what if they did go eight and five this year? How much pressure it, would Brian Kelly really feel that pressure? I think, I think the answer is yes, but I don't think, I think he's done this long enough, and I think they paid him a big enough contract. You know, he's not. I don't think he's a guy that's super worried about the money, but I think at this point in his career, he's more so, uh, the pressure doesn't get to him because I think he's more so just so focused on uh, taking the necessary steps to winning a national championship. Now, he already completed, uh, we talk about Brian Kelly. If Brian Kelly is the, the video game character, you know, you talk, he completed, he got past a, a major level beating Alabama. Now, the next step, the next step is winning a national championship. It's likely going to have to go through the hands of the Georgia Bulldogs. So that is a, that's going to be a, a critical step for Brian Kelly. But I think Brian Kelly, you know, at this point, you know, for Nick Saban, even though he doesn't like to admit this because he's always on his grind, for Nick Saban, the battle is fighting, fighting to get complacent. Now, Nick Saban's a guy who, you know, his purpose and kind of what inst his dad instilled in him, he's, uh, he's always trying to do his best, and he's always battling, a, you know, trying to win with a new team. He, uh, he kind of looks at it from a different perspective, but I know deep down that's something that he's battling with, even if he doesn't say. I think at this point, Brian Kelly, what's interesting about him as a coach is he's not just – Brian Kelly is not just a guy who – you know, he's done this long enough, but he's not just a guy who's f trying to battle complacency, which I think somewhat's the case for him, but he's a guy that still, there's obstacles in the way where he is still, where he's, well, I say he's, he is, I say he should be hungry. So I think with all the obstacles in place, Brian Kelly should be a very hungry football coach. And he's a guy that's still continuing to lev up, level up and a guy that still has a chip on his shoulder uh, fighting through the levels of the video game. Now, everyone is, you know, if everyone in life is kind of uh, trying to level up, you know, it's it, the I love the quote uh, from Bo Schembecker, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. So Brian Kelly, to me, I believe is still getting better and he knows there's room for improvement. You know, this last year was the ultimate glimpse of, you know, last year, I guess is the, um, to kind of use the analogy, I feel like it, it LSU is kind of at the, um, they're at almost a, a crossroad. And if there's one road, if one road is leading to a national title and the other road is leading back to, you know, just being the other road is being good. You know, what is the quote? Good is great. Great is the good is the enemy of great. You know, I feel like 
LSU, you know, they're at that crossroad. You know, are they is this year is this the year where they can take the they take the right path to getting to the national championship, or are they just gonna because you're not you know getting better or getting worse, or they take a step back? So to me, that's why I feel like eight and five. You know, it just it almost kind of hurts me to say. That's why you feel like an eight win, nine win season, anything less than last year. You just feel like it just it would leave like you ever have that dull, just dull, almost kind of depressed feeling. To me, that's what LSU going eight and five would be. Now it's because it's not it'd just be, you know, sometimes it's like with the NFL draft. Sometimes like if you're you want your team to just either be horrible, either be really good, or just absolutely horrible. You know, sometimes being average just can kill you. You know, it eats you alive, especially in the NFL. Like if your team's average over and over, you're going to just get a mid-round pick. Uh, it's likely a guy that who, you know, get a mid-round pick. You know, likely a guy that might be good. But sometimes, and then in college, like you don't really want to, you know, not to attack someone's job, but sometimes in college you just want your team, you know, your team being average sometimes hurts you more than them just being horrible. Because if you, if you know your team's just horrible, you can kind of just accept it. But if your team you know, underperforms just good enough. Like that, that can be as painful, uh, as, as them just being absolutely horrible. So that's the thing with LSU, you know, this is not, there's too much talent in this team for the, for them, for things to fall off the rail, but eight and five, nine win season, you know, anything less than this past year, um, I think is going to really eat at some LSU fans. And it really, it really hurts, uh, even saying that, but you know, Brian Kelly, uh, the, the main point of this take is Brian Kelly, I think at this point, should still be hungry and, and continuing to look to level up and, and embracing uh, the challenge. And that's what, that's what he said when he came to LSU. He understands, the, he understands the grind of the SEC. And like I touched on with Swamp Kings, that documentary about Florida, Urban Meyer talked about the, the SEC is a grind and winning a national championship is hard. And I think that Brian Kelly, Brian Kelly would reiterate the same thing. It is not easy to win a national championship. Maybe in a video game, maybe in NCAA football, maybe in Madden, winning the super. You know, even if you can, you can set the the skill level low. You know, you can win all. Even that is hard uh, on a video. You know, it can be hard on a video game if you put it at a high skill level. But this is, you know, in real life. You know, it is a grind. There is, you know, the world. The world is so competitive. You know, men are competitive and. You know, each week there's a team that is gunning for you. You know, LSU. What is the what is the expression? LSU is now the the hunted more so than the hunter. Now, they could argue that they still are the hunter, but after last, you know, they've talked about this before. I think Gilroy talked about this in his interview. You know, they they know they're not going to sneak up on anyone this year. Preseason number five, they understand the expectations. Um, you know, Gilroy said it's not about how good we can be, it's how great we can be. So to me, I think they believe they can be great, which is, is, is very important. So yeah, it's going to be going to be exciting, uh, exciting season. Just, a, just over a week away, uh, counting down the days to LSU football. It's, it's coming up and, uh, yeah, and uh, what is the? Some people say the talking season's over soon, so we'll have uh, football to talk about. College football today. Uh, I'm gonna watch Notre Dame. Notre Dame takes on Navy. I'm gonna watch some of that game, and then uh, USC San Jose State. I think that could be an interesting game. USC 31 point favorites uh, in that one. So yeah, it's awesome, awesome to see college football back. You know, I wish there were some better Week Zero games. To be honest, um, you know. I, <laughs> To, what was it? a couple years ago? Yeah, Florida Miami. That was a, a fun Week Zero game. I think it adds a little bit more intrigue, uh, a little bit more excitement to college football if you have at least one Week Zero game that's really good. Um, but yeah, LSU, LSU just uh, about eight days away from playing Sunday night, seven thirty ABC. They take on uh, the Florida State Seminoles and one of the must. Uh, one of the the most anticipated non-conference game this season. This Thursday, y'all, you got Florida Utah. That'll be another really fun and exciting game as well, too. So, yeah, I can't uh, really pumped. Um, you know, college football. You know, the start of college football just always has me amped up, even since I was a little kid. Uh, so yeah, exciting. 
exciting stuff. So yeah, just uh, I'm going to wrap with that, guys. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. Make sure to stay tuned for more episodes and clips from the show. Thank you for your continued support uh, and uh, have a great day. Until next time, peace.